It's time for 41 is the Mike, a weekly Chiefs podcast with Nick Jacobs of KSHB 41 and Matt Derrick of Chiefs Digest. 41 is the Mike starts now. Yes, everyone, welcome back. You are with 41 is the Mike. I am Matt Derrick from Chiefs Digest alongside new eras and tour enthusiast Nick Jacobs. Hey Matt, it's been KSHB. a whole yeah. Hey Matt, it's been a whole <laughs> it's been a whole week since people have been able to listen to Forty One as a mic. It's been a whole I week know. and three almost three days. I was just thinking this morning how glad I am that we're back on a semi regular schedule for a while that we don't have any practices that require some special episodes or ring ceremonies or anything like that. We can just hit the Sunday feed. I can start my Sunday with you, Nick, and and have the beginning of a great week. Well, it could be worse, Matt. I don't know how much worse, but it could be worse. <laughs> so this is saying. this is like the best way to start my week. Well, Matt, I I, I love mean, without, the glass full mentality. <laughs> without being, I guess, in Portugal with a uh, star quarterback, or being in at Wembley with the uh, star tight end, or hanging out with Tom Cruise and Hugh Grant and Ashton Kutcher. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of lot of people in that uh, in that the VIP tent that were you knew their first and last name. <laughs> The question is, you know, when are we going to be doing a podcast talking about Travis Kelsey's role in what Tom Cruise movie? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know if we should start today, but I mean, I've already started on, you know, on X about some, you know, some Tom Tom Cruise film opportunities that I think Travis would be great for involving Top Gun 3 or maybe one of the eight or nine or ten Mission Impossibles, you know. There are plenty, there are plenty of opportunities, so... There's 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 chances for Travis. Mm-hmm. There really is. But, well, while the team is away, and when I'm talking about teams away, I mean pretty much everybody's away. Nick, I mean this time of year, I mean the and remember the Chiefs basically with the way that they ended up the ring ceremony have a whole, about just a month off. So it's a month until training camp, less than a month now where we sit. It is, I guess, by my number seven twenty three days, Nick, until we head up to St. Joe for the first time. I will. I will. I, I'm not going to use numbers. I'm going to say it's definitely less than a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely less than a month. I think um, fans are what Sunday the twenty first, twenty second, somewhere around there. Yes, I know it's on Sunday. Um, uh, Sunday the twenty first is the yep. first day for fans. That is the first open day, but you know, we'll hear from the rookies and the quarterbacks when they start checking into the dorms on the sixteenth. And if I got to be there in the heat, Nick, that's when it counts for me. Oh no, I'm not saying don't count it. <laughs> I will never say that to you. <laughs> uh, but we are working, whereas everybody mm-hmm. else is on vacation, whether they're in Europe or on the beach with their kids. I mean, front office, this is when everybody in the NFL coaches all get away for their last chance. So um, not a lot of bodies right now over at One Arrowhead Drive. But we're working, Nick, and what are we working on this week? We're working on looking at the Chiefs roster and where they sit right now after OTAs, how they have come together, what they look like heading into training camp, um, breaking out the position groups, where the Chiefs are kind of strongest, where they're maybe the weakest, where the questions are. Um, there's a lot of things. I mean, uh, I think there's some easy decisions at a couple of places. I actually have a 53 player roster that I will be that will be up, and you'll be able to find the link to that in this video. So if you want to go check out what we're both talking about, I think Nick, you're going to have a story as well about your roster breakdown at some point. Yes, the keywords at some so, point. <laughs> at some point. So we'll make sure the link goes into the, into the video here so you can find it. Um, but let's just get kick-started, Nick. Let's talk about the offensive side of the football. And I guess we can just start with the easiest position because quarterback probably doesn't require a whole lot of discussion. It's it's definitely the position group I feel the best about. Yeah, I mean, you've only got obviously four guys. Um, just for me personally, I'm going to call it locks and, locks and bubbles on my end. Matt, you can do the whole, the full 53. Um, <laughs> but for me, like locks, obviously Patrick Mahomes and Carson Wentz. Like that's just obvious in that front. The one that I'm going to be interested on is Chris uh, Oladokun. What, what do they want to put him on the 53 and use that roster spot? Or do they try to sneak him on practice squad? What type of performance he has in the preseason, I think is really going to be able to answer that about if they think a team will take him because of what he does in preseason or if they don't feel he would. Um, and then book that they have as their fourth guy. I think he's just trying, I think his fate is determined by 
how, where they end up putting uh, Chris at. If Chris is going to be on practice squad, then I don't think Book will be on the practice squad. But if Chris is on the 53, maybe Book gets a practice squad opportunity. So that's why that one's the easiest for me. What about you, Matt? Yeah, same. I mean, I... I... I think there's, you know, Old Oaken is absolutely one of those borderline candidates, and it's certainly going to depend on what the Chiefs need to do at some other positions, whether they think there's a concern that they might lose him if they had to place him on waivers. Um, there's no doubt. I mean, he's he's got, still has a lot of upside, I think. Um, he looked good last year's preseason. He, I think he's continued to look better and better year by year. And not that it's important, but there is a factor. He's been a really good practice squad scout team quarterback for them, especially when um, you think about how well the Chiefs did last year against some mobile quarterbacks. You know, part of it is Old Oaken did a really good job of prepping them. He played a lot of uh, of the mobile guys that the Chiefs faced last year, including Lamar in the playoffs. And remember how well the the Chiefs defended him. I mean, that's you know having having a guy like Old Oaken who can throw the ball a little bit and run a little bit is a good guy to have. So um, let's see what happens. I am of the philosophy, like just like you are. That's that's a pretty easy one. Oladokun is a, a borderline candidate, but um, unless he doesn't get swiped in a waiver claim at the, at the end of the uh, training camp, I think he will be back with this team, at least on the practice squad. Um, you go into the running back room, Nick. It's still not a large group because the Chiefs have whittled away a couple of names. Mm. I mean, they've they've let go of Mike, Michael P. Ryan. Um uh, I'm, now I'm starting to blank on the on the guy that I actually like. Hassan, Hassan Hall. Thank you for their Hassan Hall. Thank you very much. I thought Hassan was actually looking pretty good, but um, Chiefs have parted ways with him. It's a slimmer down room now, mm-hmm. but I still think there's a couple of you know interesting decisions and possibilities here. How about you? Yeah, I mean, for me, first is Pacheco and Clyde over to Those are your two locks. Those are the guys yep. that should make it without a problem. Then the rest of it. Who the heck knows right now? That's where when the pads come on, that's where you'll start getting answers on that one. Because, I mean, for me, I think Bailey had the strongest OTAs in minicamp. Uh, the undrafted free agent got out of TCU. I think he had the strongest. But Prince has the most, you know, the probably the most time invested in him from a coaching perspective. And then signing him last year as an undrafted guy. And then you obviously have Ingram, who they got late last year. What can he's more of a, I think, a big, bigger style running back size wise that you can definitely keep up with. Uh, then Rezamit is the question mark. You're not 100% sure what he will or won't be. And every single one of those guys, I think it generally comes down to how do they look when the shoulder pads come on from a pass protection perspective. And then also the thing that the knock I have on Prince that would keep him from the 53 for me was that his pass protection struggled last year. And on top of that, he always not uh, more than more times than not. He didn't seem to be able to break tackles. It's just once somebody got either got a, he was able to grab his ankle or be able to kind of just get a hold of him. He would just, he fell forward most of the time. He couldn't break contact and keep a run going. So I think those were two of the biggest strikes against him last year. So that's my question is, has he improved on those two parts or not? Cause if he hasn't, then I don't see him on the 53. If he has, then I think he becomes kind of the front runner for that. But right now to me, Bailey's been the most consistent and shown before shoulder pads that what he is capable of. So you have that aspect of, and then uh, steel. I don't. I mean, we'll see what happens, but I don't know if he's going to be on the roster as the fullback or if he's more of a practice squad guy because they're just. She's based a lot on contact, and and <laughs> that won't come till training camp. So we'll see how much he gets used on special teams, how much he would be in as a fullback in the starting offense, potentially with the ones and those, those will answer that question on his status. Yeah. I, once again, I mean, I, and my roster construction that I've got, it, it's based on what we've seen so far, not what I think is going to happen mm-hmm. on August 31st. It, it's based on what we've seen so far. So things will definitely and can change. I mean, based on what we've seen thus far, from my vantage point of a, of a, of a, a you know, depth chart breakdown, Daenerys Prince would be the number three running back right now. Right. And I've increasingly have Lewis Rezamit making this team. I mean, I've got him in my, my 53 right now. 
Um, just because of the way that the Chiefs keep using him in so many different ways, and certainly the way that Dave Tobe talks about him and is using him on special teams, um, that it certainly seems like they're going to carve out a roster spot for him. And and with Lewis Rezamit, I just I still would assume that he is not a player that the Chiefs would feel like, hey, if if you know a couple of guys go down in the game, which has happened before at running back, are you comfortable with him then you know playing the entire half of football as your only running back? That I'm not sold on. So that's mm. why I think there's a possibility that, you know, the, the Chiefs do keep four running backs. Now, the question is going to be, how do they handle that on game day? Uh, that could be an interesting question mark in and of its own. But uh, I've, I've, I've got him keeping four right now with Prince and Rui Zamet. Uh, it's Imani Bailey, however, is the most interesting guy in that room to watch. He is somebody I think absolutely during training camp can make a push. And if anybody's going to overtake take Prince for that spot, I, I think it's Bailey. Um, wide receiver was a really tough one for me. And oh. I, I went through my first pass and my last change is one that I'm just assuming Nick, that uh, I'm going to say my, my wide receiver is going to let, let, the, let them go with yours because I think people will probably like your group better. Everybody's going to be mad at me when they hear what I did at the receiver group. You might, Hey, you might as well just rip the bandaid off now and go for it. <laughs> well, I'm going to utter, utter a couple of words that I know the Chiefs friends were hoping not to hear again this year. One is I have the Chiefs keeping seven receivers right now, mm-hmm. which uh, I know some people are saying, hey, if you have seven receivers again, like last year, you don't have any receivers. Not necessarily the case. I mean, there's four absolute locks for me. Hollywood Brown, Rasheed Rice, Justin Watson, Xavier Worthy. Um, Nico Remigio, if he keeps playing the way he is when the pads come on, is going to make himself a lock. But right now I've got him in as, as at least the number five. I mean, he could be, I, I, I wouldn't put, move him ahead of anybody. I mean, if Worthy is, you know, struggling with injuries, I mean, if we had, if Watson, you know, slows down a step, maybe he does move up. I, you know, no, no, but right now I'm at least having him in the number five. I mean, and Hey, somebody else could overtake him. I mean, it is that close. It's razor thin there. But I also have the Chiefs sticking around with Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony. And on my first pass, I didn't because I had them, you know, leaving one of these guys off. But just just trying to dig into the way that that Brett Veach and Andy Reid view things, I'm still just not sold that they're ready to walk away from either one of those players. And and walking away from Tony, it, hey, I get it. It's not a big big uh, contract number. It's only like two and a half million dollars. But his entire contract is guaranteed this year. And are you just willing to light that on fire without seeing if you can get anything from him on special teams or in a, a, just the, a, a gadget role where he's been successful? Um, but I still, I mean, obviously injuries can play into this, and injuries have been a problem with with Kadarius Tony. Um, but I think that if the Chiefs, whether the Chiefs keep six or seven, I have six players. Five players, really. I mean, Nico, I'm I'm moving out of that category right now. He's kind of in his own own situation. But I would have more Tony, McCole Hardman, Justin Ross, and Montreal Washington in kind of the bubble for that maybe one or two spots. Um, Cornell Powell, I'm assuming that the Cornell Powell outstanding play of OTAs and we'll continue until the pads come on and then we'll start to see him kind of fade back again. I mean, it's not a knock on Cornell. It's just seen the movie too many times. Um, I'm going to assume that it's going to end the same way, but he would be at the top of the next list, but that's how at least I've got it right now. I don't feel comfortable. I mean, I, this is not one that I, it's not like quarterback. Where I'm saying that's hundred percent how it might mm-hmm. look. The receiver room has got a lot of wiggle room and a lot of things that could happen between now and the beginning of September. Yeah, I think uh, for the most part at the wide receiver room, like Brown, Rice, Worthy, Watson, those are your four locks. Those are the ones that you're you're you know you're going to be going with on the fifty three minus any injury happening during training camp or preseason. After that, I I have Hardman kind of on that at that number five spot potentially because of <clears throat> I I think part of it is. What Hartman's benefit is for them, he knows the offense. He knows most of the offense, and I think that he could fill in if he needed to for Brown or Worthy. And I think with Worthy's hamstring I- issue, I think that's why McColl got brought in when he did. And also with Kadarius Tony not being there, I think that's another reason he was also brought in. So between those two things and them not knowing what the 
when the rice thing will happen in terms of resolution. And you just, you know, you don't know when the league may decide they want to do something. If it's before or after, you know, that goes through the legal system. So then you have McCole Hardman becomes part of your insurance. So then I just, I think he, he answers a lot of questions when you're looking at situations and circumstances. So I think that's why more than likely you have him. I understand there's an option to put him on practice squad and everything. And I, I get that, but I just, I don't, if a guy solves three to five, if the guy can answer three to five situations for you, I just don't think you want to take that risk of another team being like, you know what? Yeah, no, we'll take a chance. It's just, it just doesn't seem like the way the chiefs approach that doesn't mean that they won't. I'm just saying that just, it'd go against the grain of what I think they do. Um, then Remigio, I feel like is right, right behind, right behind that. And like you said, as long as he can continue to translate what he did from OTAs and mini camp and shoulder pads, when he's getting jammed at the line and is able to get off the releases, run good routes and be able to catch the ball cleanly. Like he does, like he did from all three quarterbacks. And that's, that's the biggest thing I have for him is every single quarterback look comfortable throwing him the football, all three of them. And to have a receiver who seems to mesh with every single one of those quarterbacks, that's a really big thing to where, whether he works with the one, two or three, like, that may be one of the safety blankets for, you know, no matter if there's a situation where each quarterback has to come in, like he helps make that happen. So I just, I think that that's a very undervalued part of why he would be appealing. Um, after that, I think I, I just have Tony Moore and Ross grouped together to where I think they'll give Kadarius Tony every chance to succeed. And I think they'll, if I were in their shoes, I would showcase them in preseason and see if there's a trade available to potentially move him and, you know, move that money. Um, and then with Sky Moore, I just, I think Sky Moore is going to be really dependent on what they decide to do with McCole Hardman or Remigio. And I think that's going to kind of answer a Sky Moore question there. And Ross, I think, is just, I think he's purely based on what numbers they have left at that point. Because for the most part, I mean, I'll say this, like when he's out on the field, when he was out on the field with Mahomes at times, Mahomes would look, but like, you know, Mahomes is typically going to throw the ball somewhere else with the other options he had available. So, I mean, there just wasn't a lot of connection there during those practices. And then I just, he has a better, he has a better connection with Wentz and, uh, it, don't remember how much he worked with uh, with Chris. So, I mean, he, I, I saw him with every single one of the quarterbacks, and I'm like, his best connection was with Wentz, and there were circumstances and situations where he could throw him a touchdown for the most part. Um, but it it depended on, when he was working with Mahomes, it depended on a lot of the receivers being gone that day. So, like, you know, like, it just, I don't know if he's going to get a ton of work with Patrick. And I just don't know if like the, the routes where he's strong at is what Patrick likes to throw on a routine basis. So I just, I think the tight end position, I, and I think, I think Jared Wiley is going to be a big part of like why Ross may not get the same kind of play that he would have the year before. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad you you know talked about Hardman in that way because you know between with, with Moore and Tony it wasn't a slam dunk for me to just say those two right. guys without including McCall Hardman. I mean, I would have I I'd safely say it was those three players for the last one or two spots mm-hmm. with some other guys also obviously in the mix too. But you, you're right. I mean, and the makeup of that room as far as the styles and the sizes, I mean, the composition. I mean, you've got to try and make it all work. And injuries could absolutely play into that. I mean, if if Worthy is not healthy or somebody else gets dinged up in anything, and you feel like you need some insurance, maybe you go a different direction. And and there was a connection to me between receiver and tight end going into our next group because when I added a seventh receiver, it meant I couldn't keep four tight ends now. So I'm I have three tight ends, but I'm I'm guessing you and I have the tight end room stacked almost identically, which would be obviously your your goat all time, you know, Travis Kelsey is your starter. 
Um, Jared Wiley, Noah Gray will be your backups. I'm guessing you probably have Irv Smith on the roster right now, but would be your four guy. Baylor Cup is the the guy that you really want to see more of that there's upside, and Garrett Prince is 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 there just in case. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you're spot on with the first three because I got Kelsey Wiley and uh, Gray in that order, and. I, uh, Wiley may not be the guy that gets a ton of the reps early on in training camp, and they may let him get comfortable and everything, but I think once they're well into the season, I think Wiley's going to have a steady rise the entire time, and and how glowingly Travis Kelsey talked about him on the New Heights podcast was similar to what you and I had been saying for weeks on end about what he was doing out there, and to hear Travis kind of validate what both you and I have kind of said and thought, I was like, well, at least I'm not crazy. So, um, So that was good on that front. <laughs> And yeah, I just, I think Wiley's just a, he's a different type of tight end than what they've had there to where he he's the best of both worlds in terms of size and athletic ability. And I just don't think the chiefs have had a tight end like him since Travis has been here because of the, lot of the guys they had here, they were always trying to develop from basketball. Wiley, they don't have to, they don't have to do the, you know, the learning curve of developing, like I just I think he's already past the Dimitri Harris and the Ross Travises of the world and the Jody Fortsons who had to develop with that over time. And it I mean, they both all all of them collectively had their their pros, but it's just Wiley's already passed all that. And so it's just more about him getting comfortable in the offense and learning from Kelsey and getting comfortable with where Mahomes wants the football or where Wentz wants to put the football. And I just I think that's what where he's at. Um Irv Smith, I don't have as a lock right now. I just I don't know what what they're gonna do from a running back perspective. Are they keeping four? Are they keeping five? Receiver wise, are they keeping four? I mean, excuse me, are they keeping five or six or seven? And then I think that determines what they do at tight end. Irv Smith is more than capable of making the roster and being the fourth guy. It's just a matter of for me, kind of what where do the numbers. There's the one number I'm trying to guess is who's the where's the extra number at? Like I said, is it running back, wide receiver, tight end, or O line, or running back or wide receiver O line to help with the tight end or not? And then the Baylor Cup, I, I would put on practice squad because there's a lot to work with there, and there but there's also a lot of unknown. And then Prince is kind of like you said, like he knows the scheme, he's worked in the scheme long enough now to where he could be a quality practice squad player if they want him. Yeah, he's he's, he's well versed in the system, local kid too. So nothing not to root for there. Um, it's just a very talented group. I mean, Chiefs have got a lot of guys, and and Baylor Cup has been a nice little find. So um, be interested to see him play a little bit more. Uh, offensive line yeah. was a really tough one for me, and you know, mostly because of numbers. Uh, I mean, I think that the to me the probably depth chart is fairly straightforward. It's just how many are you going to keep? How many are you going to protect? I kept a lot, Nick. I'm kind of interested to see how your stacks up and see how where you draw the line about how many offensive linemen the Chiefs might need to keep. So initially I have nine right now. I could see it going to 10. So for me, obviously, uh, I'm just going to do it in order. It's not my best to worst. Um, just in order, I got Wani Morris, Joe Tooney, Creed Humphrey, Trey Smith, Jawan Taylor, Kingsley, Hunter Norzad, uh, Lucas Niang, and Caliendo. So those are the ones that I think are kind of should, for the most part, be locks on the roster. Hanson, I think it's really a question of what he does in training camp and preseason about if he needs to stay on the practice squad or if they think he could be a quality uh, 10th guy. And that may be where the number affects what happens to tight end, wide receiver, running back, is if Hanson is a guy that they want to keep on the active 53. Godric, I think, is still kind of battling for a spot, and I think that really kind of comes down to what can he... I know he can... I know he's he's had to work at left tackle and right tackle, so I think he's had that, and I think that works in his favor. Um, and then Driscoll is a guy that I really think is going to be on their practice squad and be a developmental guy. Um, but I think that that's kind of how that, how that works out, but I've got nine with, I think three others competing for a 10 spot right now. 
and two of those guys being tackles and one being an interior. Because, I mean, right now, you've got, on on what I've got, you've got three, four, you got five guys that can play interior. So you're bringing a six in or you bring in another tackle that can kind of potentially swing or develop. That's really kind of the question headed into camp. Yeah, I we have we have the structure exact, identical. I mean, as, as far as how the depth chart is stacked, and I feel like it's pretty obvious. I mean, as far as mm-hmm. like, especially the Chiefs have been you know rolling through OTAs, I don't think there's a whole lot of surprises. Um, True Godric is the international designation, so there is some protections there. The Chiefs can keep him on the practice squad, even if because uh, I don't believe a team can even claim him off waivers when they do the right. cut down off the exemption. So um, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, question to me, and I, I went ahead and kept 10 because I, I just, I think the chiefs are going to want to keep CJ Hansen, um, mm-hmm. even though he's a late round pick, you know, I, I've, I've seen enough. I mean, we need to see more to make sure that it's not a, you know, fool's gold or anything like that. I mean, I think there's enough upside there to continue to protect him and to keep him. And that's the challenge. I mean, if you're the chiefs and you're looking towards next year, when you certainly feel like there's a possibility, you might have to replace two of your interior players. Mm-hmm. Well, you feel pretty good if one of those is Hunter Norzad is replacing them then, but then is it Mike Caliendo or would you rather have Hanson around to the two to be potentially either, you know, competition or the starter in one of those spots, or at least your, your backup behind the, you know, that starting line. So I feel like that that's the only reason I've got, you know, Hanson as, as my 10th guy, because I think that you have that need to have that protection. Um, but not a hundred percent there. Um, Caliendo is, he might be close. I'd probably put him in the 90% category because the Chiefs do seem to have a lot of faith in him. Mm-hmm. The question I have is going to be, I mean, because the guy who's not a guaranteed spot for me is Lucas Nia. And, you know, and there's been a lot of positive talk about Ethan Driscoll. I mean, if, if they feel like Ethan Driscoll's for real and you can save a little bit of money and this is a, a player who obviously is reasonably healthy, if, uh, uh, supposedly, I mean, at this point in his career and an and, and upwardly improving player, and you've got Niang who's been coming off a hip surgery, you know, coming into the league, then you added on the, the patella tendon, I mean... He came back from that, but it's just what is Lucas Niang? I mean, is he is he somebody who can be that swing tackle, play on the left side, right side if you need them to? Mm. I don't know. And I mean, you're just asking to be the fourth tackle with Wanye on there. So if if Ethan Driscoll could be your fourth tackle, where where do you sit? That's that's a tough one for me. So I mean, I I would assume that Lucas Niang will make this team and be one of those guys, but it's not a slam dunk, and obviously neither's. The Chiefs keeping 10. I mean, 9 or 10, I think, is a reasonable number. But your mileage may vary, Nick. There it is. I knew you, you, were, you were just waiting for it. Oh, buddy. <laughs> All right. Let's swing over to the defensive side, where the defensive line, for me, was even tougher than offensive line. Um, there, I, I, I can't, I cannot make heads or sense, heads or tails, make sense, heads or tails. Makes my metaphors, Matthew. Very, very good. I'm a professional writer, everyone. Um, the Outside of the top six players on the defensive line, it's wide open to me. I mean, and how many players that the Chiefs could keep? Seven, eight, nine? They've kept crazy 10 before. I don't think it's going to be that crazy, mm. but there's a lot of question marks, Nick. Yes, there is. Yeah, uh, for me, I'm... I'm... <laughs> Chris Jones is going to be one lock. Uh, George <laughs> Carlotis, another. Vili Sanidiki Uzama. Mike Dana. Um, I have Mike Pinnell on here right now, but I could see them being, like you've talked about before, like there's there's an opportunity to where maybe, maybe he goes to practice squad if you need that. I just have too many question marks right now to not have a world where Mike Pinnell may not be a part of the Chiefs right now. And then Tershawn Wharton. I think those are the guys that you would be comfortable with on a roster. Now, the question I have is how Derek Nottie performs coming back from the elbow slash arm injury and how he can, how he can do there. Uh, Neil Farrell will see what he can do as a one tech. Um, Love it is another guy I'm intrigued by to see what he could potentially be. I just, I don't, I have no idea yet because the shoulder pads not being on that will answer a lot of questions. Once that happens though, about the D line, I think that'll give us a ton of clarity. Um, Herring seems like a guy that's probably going to be on the roster and 
just simply because of versatility and where they can put him at uh, all over the defensive line, but I just don't think he's going to be a guy that kind of stands out and gives you ble- big flash moments. Um, Dickerson, just a you know, just a guy that's kind of honestly kind of there for the most part. Um, B.J. Thompson, who knows what you know until you have that health thing answered. Like you just you don't know what that status is going to be overall until you get those questions answered. A mini you, I wonder if he'll be on the PUP list to start out and to give him time to get back up to 100 percent and what they do there. And then uh, Jones, I'm still the other Jones. I'm not sure about in terms of what Truman can or can't be along that defensive line. So that's why I, I put who I did. And so in that one, I've only got six that I'm sure about for the most part. And then the question is, who's the other defensive tackle or defensive end that they want to have in that group? Because right now I've only got technically three defensive tackles and kind of three defensive ends. Yeah, and it, I, and I have very similar. I mean, I've got of my six locks. I I have Tershawn Wharton as one of the six, and mm. and I have Pinnell as a projected practice squad player for this reason only. I mean, I and I had a chance to talk to him for a few minutes after because he was one of the panelists at the discussion about technology and um, tradition uh, last week at the Linda Hall Library and. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion. If you haven't seen that, you should search it out and, and check it out. It's a really interesting, fascinating discussion. I should, I'll put the link for that in the, video, in the YouTube video as well. Um, but it, it, Mike said that, you know, because I, I, I said to him that I was kind of surprised that he signed so quickly and didn't take a veteran prerogative to, you know, skip, uh, you know, OTAs and everything and maybe wait things out a little bit. And he said it was really important to him that he wanted to be here through the entire process, that he didn't want to be working on his own and everything, that if the Chiefs wanted him back this year in a similar role, that he wanted to be here the entire time. And remember, I mean, as a veteran, he's got you know, contract prerogative. When when they when they cut down players, he doesn't go on waivers. He becomes a free agent that can sign anywhere. And Mike Pinnell doesn't really doesn't want to go anywhere. I mean, he wants to be in KC, but he's 33 years old. So I mean, I think you saw the best of Mike Pinnell last year, and you saw it because he was limited until the really just late in the season into the postseason and, and kind of saved him up. Um, I joked during the off season, Nick, that dude, that's what I would do. I would, I, I would just, mm. I'd tell Mike Pinnell during free agency, I would say, I'd just say, Mike, we're going to sign you to the practice squad. Don't worry about it. Go to Texas, you know, hang out, work out and everything like that. November 1st, you're back up here. Um, pretty clear, you know, Hey, Mike wants to be here with this team. And so if that means, you know, keeping him on the uh, around right, right this time of year, so he can work out and stay fresh and everything. Great. But I don't think you want Mike Pinnell to have played 20 or 21 games. So, you know, that's why to me, the, the ideal way to manage him, um, the load management was a great discussion the other night, Nick, about analytics. And the, the load management would say with Mike Pinnell, you need to back off of him and just save him for the important half of the season. Okay, well, so let's say you do that. Who, who are your defensive tackles? Um, I mean, Neil Farrell and Fabian Lovett would be my three, four, or will be my four and five guys after mm-hmm. you know, after Jones, Naughty, and Tershawn Wharton. Uh, defensive ends the same way. I mean, your fourth defensive end is Malik Herring, and I don't think there's any change to that. I mean, unless you go out and bring in a veteran, and that's because, you know, I, I'm assuming a minute who, like you, will start on the pop list. I can't imagine a scenario where he won't. Um, it would defy all odds if he didn't start training camp on the pop list. But that would at least at least change the equation. I think once the season starts and he, you know, his return becomes more of a possibility. But yeah, and I don't know about B.J. Thompson. Is that a guy that you're considering for a pop list as well? We don't know. I mean, it's great that he's made the recovery. We got to see him at the ring ceremony, but that's an unknown. And there are so many. And there was at least one thing that we saw during the mini camp, Nick, that I don't know if it was just because of a numbers thing or, you know, one of those things that the Chiefs like with flexibility, but Neil Farrell lined up a couple of times outside. 
And maybe that is a third down package look. Maybe that's something that they want to see, you know, if he can do that and kick outside. But if he's got that, Malik Herring's got that, you know, versatility. I mean, those are guys that you could keep around for those reasons. Um, Matt Dickerson obviously is another guy. I mean, he's just cleared waivers this offseason. So I think that's another player, if you a veteran, if you wanted to keep him on the practice squad, you could. Um I don't know what the Chiefs are going to do with Isaiah Bugs. I'm not even sure if the Chiefs know what they're going to do with Isaiah Bugs yet. We'll, we'll see him in St. Joe or not. But I don't think he's a serious part of the conversation right now. But that can yeah, change. Yeah, I, I left his name off the list for a reason yeah. in that front. Yeah. Um, going into linebackers. This is a rich group, Nick. And, and, and I did something stupid here. Or at least not necessarily stupid, but maybe against my own logic. Okay. Because I, I did two things on defense that are maybe against my own logic. Because we're talking about the kickoff rules and maybe needing to keep an extra linebacker, maybe even an extra safety to get some bigger athletes and everything that can play on on this on the new kickoff coverages. And then I didn't really do that. I mean, I kept five linebackers and four safeties, and that's I mean, I didn't really keep an extra one in e- either one of them, Nick. Yeah, I mean, for me, there's there's three hundred percent for sure. Tranquil, Bolton, Chanel, yep. like those are the three that I'm hundred percent sure on. After that, I mean, Cochran seems to have kind of a grasp of being the green dot if needed from last year. So you kind of see if there's anybody that can kind of take his position. Um, Jacobs, Curtis Jacobs, who knows right now? Christensen, probably a little bit slower, but can play special teams. Jones, I'm not sure about, and then Washington and Bozeman, no idea about. So, I mean, you have three that you know what you're getting from, 100%. Cochran could potentially be a fourth you know what you're getting from. But until I see all the other guys, I don't know where they're going to be at from a ranking perspective. And what, But if there are guys that can play special teams and make a big impact, then I think they all kind of raise themselves up more than other years to where they could be used on kick return in a way that, Maybe they couldn't have in years past. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit, I'm pretty bullish on Cam Jones. Um, I was before week 18 last year, but he had, what, 11 tackles in that game? He was pretty spectacular, and he wasn't healthy at the beginning of the season. That was, you know, one of the things that challenged his roster bid last year. Um, I'm I'm pretty bullish on him, so I've got him as one of my 53. I'm with you, though. I mean, um, Cole Christensen's an experienced guy. That's somebody who could, you know, if, whether it's a practice squad position, anything else. I mean, he he's versatile enough to be able to – he could make the team, not make the team, but he could still be around. Curtis Jacobs has looked impressive, but I need to see more. But he's somebody I would absolutely keep on the practice squad. Um, those would be the two guys that I have out right now. I would ha- I have Cam Jones and Jack Cochran on for exactly the reasons that you said with Cochran, for sure. I mean, he's got three-position versatility. Not the fastest guy in the world, but he's pretty reliable. So he can do a lot of things for you, and obviously special teams are a big part of that. And then, yeah, Washington and Bozeman are just complete unknowns. They're kind of in the mix for me. I think it would be tough to see either one of them make it a, make it a move because I, I do think that the Chiefs are reasonably deep here. I mean, I think that they've got seven players for sure that they trust. It's just a matter of, you know, a couple of like Jacobs being able to prove himself once the pads come on. Uh, Cam Jones backing up what he did last year. But if that's the case, I mean, that's a reasonably deep group, Nick. All right. Just for the record, anybody with the last name Jacobs is going to prove themselves without a problem. <laughs> that is true. I cannot dispute that. That is an undeniable fact of life. Just, just <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> well, let's move into the secondary. And don't know if you have your separated out by corners and safeties. I do. Yeah. So that'll be the easiest way for us to do it. Then let's dive into the corners. Yeah. Um, this was another one that's tough for me, Nick, because I. I'm not sure about three players that I have on my 53, Mm -hmm. and I'm definitely not sure why I left three players off my 53. I I mean, there's nine players that I like for this team, and you can't keep nine corners, obviously. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so for me, I'll go uh, McDuffie, Williams, Watson, Naze Johnson, and Nick Jones. So, I mean, those, those are the five that I'm like, hey, as long as there's no injuries, those those are the guys that I think are going to make the roster. Now, the next question I have is 
Kamal, Kamal Haddon, um, what he, if he can find his way on as a six guy or can uh, Kelvin Joseph find his way on there. Those are the ones, uh, those are the ones that I'm, I'm kind of like, either one of those guys could potentially be the six. If they're wanting to keep a six corner, then Echo, Echo Boydo, I think you're kind of looking at maybe, maybe six, maybe practice squad, uh, Taylor battle, Roland Wallace and Miller, all guys that I think for the most part are kind of battling for potential practice squad roster spots. But I, I think at the end of the day, the, the battle is really kind of coming down to Kamal, um, Haddon, Joseph and Echo Boydo for potentially six spots. Yeah, I, I'm once again. I mean, we're we're very similar here. My my top five are the same: McDuffie and Williams, N- Nazi Johnson, Nick Jones, Jalen Watson. Watson is the one I have the most concern about. I don't have him as a complete and total lock. I mean, like I said, he'd be in my top five right now, but I'd, I'd have him at number five. Um, he didn't take the step forward. I think last year that the chiefs were hoping that he would take some of those guys do it in year three. He obviously had a really impressive rookie season, but you watch what has happened and Josh Williams has moved ahead of him. I mean, I think it's pretty clear at this point that Josh Williams is ahead of him. Um, Nazi Johnson, I think will be ahead of him. I mean, Jalen, we didn't get to see at the end of OTAs because he did have an injury. So that's another X factor there. Um, Hadn't I? I have the Chiefs going ahead and keeping him as a sixth for now because I just, you know, with a I'm going to give deference to the draft pick that you're going to protect the draft pick. But you know, Echo Boydo ended the season on the 53 last year because some teams did come calling. I mean, there were there was some interest in signing him away. So, you know, you probably would lose him off waivers. Um, maybe a Kelvin Joseph and a Keith Taylor, you wouldn't because they've been around, but. They looked really impressive. If they fit in Steve Spagnuolo's scheme, maybe they are guys that are worth keeping. I mean, I can definitely see them making their case. And again, maybe those are guys that you can sneak onto the practice squad if needed, or at least one of them. Um, I'm I'm interested too. I I don't I don't have him as having a really solid chance to make the roster because I think right now he's the tenth cornerback on the list. But I'm really intrigued with Miles Battle size. I mean, I kind of want to see when the pads come on what what he can do because that's a developmental player that that i would like to see make at least make the practice squad mm-hmm. um safety i'm assuming is a pretty easy conversation nick because i th- i think we probably have uh, i only count six safeties on this team <laughs> yeah <laughs> which kind of surprises me i mean i'm surprised that you know the, the, and maybe the chiefs are considering you know maybe somebody in kind of a dual role i mean especially because we're including the, chamari connor is one of the six safeties and mm-hmm. the dude plays corner half the time mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's where i think it'll get interesting to where do they keep 11 defensive backs or do they keep 10 so do they keep, you know, six corners and four safeties, or do they keep five corners and five safeties? Um, and how they or do they get crazy and keep, you know, uh, six cornerbacks and five safeties? I don't know. Who the heck knows? But I, I am intrigued by that part of it. So yeah, obviously I got obviously Justin Reed, Brian Cook, Jamari Connor, and Jaden Hicks. Like those guys are Barring injuries, those those guys are going to be at least your four safeties. The qu- the question becomes with Bush and Dean. So with Dion Bush, he's somebody who they like they favor to put on practice squad because of how well he can do on special teams. So uh, I will say this: if special teams did drop off, I don't. I think they would develop. They would put somebody else in the developmental role. But Bush has been reliable for him and been able to be a practice squad guy. So I just feel like that's going to be the same thing over again. Um, Dean will be interesting just because once the pads do come on and he can truly actually hit people, <laughs> we will see what type of enforcer he can be um, and how much he potentially wants to hit his teammates. And uh, this isn't a knock on him. I'm just saying he came very close to where he was buzzing a lot of towers during uh, OTAs and minicamp and uh That'll be that'll be what his uh, potential reputation will be. His 
how how much he likes to hit in training camp, or does he back off because they're his teammates, and does he showcase that in preseason? I think that's just the kind of the biggest question overall on that front. Yeah, Trey, Trey Dean plays like his hair's on fire, and you gotta like that. Yeah. Um, so if if healthy, he's a guy that absolutely is going to be interesting. And and even though I, I like I said, I kind of undermined myself earlier when I said that hey, going into this exercise, you know, with the kick return rule idea being that maybe you keep an extra linebacker, keep an extra safety, there's arguably a very easy way that the Chiefs could actually still do this from the practice squad, which is if a, a Deion Bush, a Trey Dean, a Cole Christensen, and a Curtis Jacobs are on the practice squad, I mean, there's 12 activations right there, Nick, that you can bring up an extra safety or a linebacker and have them play special teams. Um, you know, that's three quarters of the season right there right. almost so you could cover that um you know there's there's and the chiefs have shown and you know they're willing to use the practice squad in that way to store some special teams players they're not on the 53 but they're going to be around um you know a Dion bush is another guy veteran doesn't have to clear waivers i think it's pretty clear that he's comfortable in kansas city winning rings and you know cashing some checks so i don't know if he would be going anywhere so that's a guy that, and the Chiefs are pretty lucky in that sense. I mean, they've got some guys that are veterans that they can do that with. That you know, if they need a roster, they've shown it that, you know, even during the off season, need a roster spot for a couple of days. Hey, we're going to release you, but we're going to bring you right back. So don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, I've I've got stacked up the exact same way you do. Trey Dean is absolutely the player to watch for me. Uh, Deion Bush, their break glass in case of emergency. Um, if he's, you need an injury, he can he can step right in and be there for you, be on the 53 even. Um, but I expect he's going to be on the practice squad and be around and be ready for the postseason, especially on special teams. Um, specialist, well, there's no drama now, Nick. I, nope. I thought we were going to have some punter drama. But nope. as of now, there is no punter drama because the Chiefs only have three specialists. They have a kicker, Harrison Butker. They have a punter in Matt Ariza. And they have a long snapper in James Winchester. The only really training camp battle to watch, I guess, will be kickoff specialist. And how much should Justin Reed and if Luis Reed Zamet ever gets a kick? Mm -hmm. I, I expect them both to get kicks. But based on what Dave Tope's saying... Or I guess rather, based on what Justin Reed's saying, is Justin Reed going to be the kickoff specialist and Harrison Butker's just going to back him up? I don't know. We'll find out because, I mean, Reed's got to play a whole bunch of other snaps on defense as well, so his legs might be a little little worn out at times. You know, I, I, I mean, Justin's a very likable player. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, he's a very smart dude. I mean, he's he's one of those guys that you just absolutely, I think, love to have it on a locker room and love to have it on a football team. And the fact that, you know, he's talking about, you know, the, 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 the new kickoff rule extending his career because, you know, he's like, hey, when, when his leg starts to go and everything and slows down a little bit, he can still be a fourth safety that can play special teams. The fact that, you know, that says a lot right there about Justin Reed. Because there's a lot of guys in the NFL who would say, "Yeah, by the time I'm a fourth safety, I'm gonna my, my butt's out of here. I'm not gonna be playing football." Justin Reed loves football. I mean, that's that's pretty clear. And when he says something like that, I mean, I think that tells you all you need to know about him as a football player. Yeah, the only question will be: Is you willing to take a fourth safety salary <laughs> at that point? <laughs> he might have to look it up and realize, you know, see what the veteran minimum is, but. <laughs> I'm just saying that'll that'll come at some point in his career, and is he okay with what he what he made during the premium years as a one or two safety? Are there are any final thoughts or any final reflections you have on on how the roster stands right now? Where maybe you think the the toughest decisions are? What you're watching for once we do get the camp? Um, I, I would say obviously uh, the receiver is going to be the most popular. Everybody's going to know how many are they keeping, who are the final guys they're keeping. For me, I'm intrigued to kind of find out at D-line and linebacker what they end up doing. Those are kind of the bigger ones for me that I think I it would be nice to have a lot more clarity on and it'll make it easier in terms of what they do roster-wise. Cornerback, you're really just looking at are you keeping a sixth guy, and if you are keeping a sixth guy, who is it? And it's safety, are you keeping a fifth guy, and if you are, who is it? Tight end, I think you've got a pretty good idea. Running back, I think you're only looking at one or two questions. Quarterback, you're not really looking at much. And O-line, you're not looking at much. But I think what you do at D-line, linebacker, those are going to be 
who's going to set themselves apart in those regards. I think that's going to be the most interesting thing. Cause when I counted up 41 of 53, I have as kind of locks for me. And that's just without the shoulder pad portion of it. So with the shoulder pad portion of it, you know, I think you'll get a, I think it'll be probably for both of us. It'll be within probably two or three guys potentially that will really kind of be asking at the end who can push themselves in that regard. But I mean, as you and I both know, for the most part, at training camp, coaching staff is probably pretty sure on like 48 of the 53. You're just kind of looking at 49, you know, 49 and on about who's going to be those final final four to five guys that can potentially make this roster and have the special team's ability to make the roster. So I think the Chiefs are probably, they're further along um, in terms of what they think. But, I mean, for me, shoulder pads are going to be the equalizer to be able to answer a lot of what I have questions on. Yeah, I think that, you know, and I, I started looking at this for me from a um, kind of a college basketball perspective, Nick, I was looking at it like, who are the four guys that I, you know, were on the borderline, you know, it's on the cusp most for me that I put on my 53 and who were the last ones that I took off? I mean, obviously, I mean, really easy one to point to is Irv Smith. You know, I had him on my 53 and took him off. So he was, he's one of my last four out, Nick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, Sky Moore and, and, and Kadarius Tony would be in that next, it would be one of the last four in. Um, my other last, my other last four are interesting because, you know, two of them, Malik Herring and Lucas Niang were in that kind of last group of discussions. Um, but I also had Jalen Watson in there because I just have some concerns and, and I think that the chiefs have obviously the Dave Merritt's voiced some of those concerns too. Um, I mean, if I were making a a potential trade list. If you're talking about the chiefs, you know, trading from a position that they have a lot of depth at, and, you know, trying to find either we make me you know, pick up more draft picks, which Brett fees always want more draft picks or trying to make a move. I mean, I think everybody in that list, except for Malik Herring and, and Kadarius Tony, I don't know. They would have a ton of trade value. I think they have values of the chiefs, but I'm not sure anybody else would be willing to give them up for them. I think there's some teams that might think that they could fix sky more. So I think that there would still be some upside to him. Jalen Watson, I think, would have some upside because I think some teams would say, wait a minute, you had a really good rookie year. You know, we're short corners. That's a talented kid. And and Jalen Watson does. I mean, clearly has a lot of talent. It's just, you know, where he fits into the room and especially with the depth that the Chiefs have there. So those were kind of my last four. My other last four out, in addition to Irv Smith, was uh, McCole Hardman, Echo Boydo, and, and uh, Kelvin Joseph. Um, I mean... All four of those could absolutely be on the roster. I mean, I could uh, week into OT, uh, to week into training camp, I could change my mind on all four of those guys and have them on the roster. I think it's just that close. I mean, I went through and, and counted, and I didn't come, I didn't remember my exact number, but I had about 61, 62 players, I think, that I had kind of in the group of could, you know, arguably make this roster pretty easily. So, there's a lot of decisions for this team to make. I mean, it's that's it, even though I don't think that there's a ton of position battles as far as starting positions goes, there's going to be a ton of position battles for the backup roles and who's going to be filling out like you had, you know, the last 12 roster spots. They're up for grabs. Time will tell, Matt. And we've Time. got less than a month until we start being able to figure it out. Time indeed will tell. Well, we're going to be back on your feeds in various places, mostly on YouTube, though, on Tuesday night with the Q&A. And always appreciate Nick coming over to help out with that. It, you know, we didn't talk about the stadium. I know that's been the big news this week. Didn't talk about the stadium in today's episode. We talked about it a lot last Tuesday. Um, you can go back and listen to that on YouTube, on the Chiefs Digest YouTube channel. If not, I am sure it's going to come up again this Tuesday. So if you got some questions, bring them um if you've got hey you've got your own roster thoughts put them into the comments send us your questions um bring if you've got some questions about our roster breakdown bring them tuesday night we'll be glad to answer them and talk about them more in depth um but with that nick yeah for those that are wondering what we're going to do next week on 41 as a mic it'll be back out on sunday at its regular scheduled time um, and what we're going to do topic wise on that is the key moves that made the chiefs who they are today since 2013. So we review Andy Reed's tenure here, what moves the organization had to make that helped them, um, be able to go to 
six consecutive AFC championship games, helped them win three Super Bowls, and the foundation that was built by Andy Reid and his staff to be able to help make that all happen and the continuity that's been able to come from it and why. So that will be that. We'll see if any competitors do it in advance than us. Um, but we have revealed that part of next week's 41 is the mic. I think it'll be very interesting for some people to go down memory lane and to disagree or agree with what we put in our rankings as the things that help make all of this happen to where you have such an interest in the Chiefs. So you say rankings. Are we going to do like our own top 10? Maybe I don't know. You and I will decide after we get done. <laughs> okay, with this, one. I'm I'm pr- I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. So uh, definitely, you want to be back here next week for that. So uh, once again, appreciate it, all of you. As always, hit the buttons, hit the likes, hit the retweets, hit the hit everything that you got. Um, if you could leave us, hey, we would appreciate you leaving us a five star review on the podcast because that does help people. If you want to leave less than a five star review, I guess I would request that you don't do that. But um, it's a free country. You may do anything that you want to. But if you would be so kind, if we're inclined to do that and left a five star review for us at, at iTunes and anywhere else you can leave a five star review, Nick, I mean, I, we would just appreciate it. It would help other people find the podcast. And uh, we always want people to find the podcast. Yes. So yeah. it helps us. It helps us rise in searches every time you do that, whether it's on YouTube or Apple. Uh, podcast or anywhere we are shameless and need the attention so you're just being each one of you is just being a sherpa that helps guide other cheese fans to another podcast love be that that, be that internet sherpa (laughs) be the sherpa i'm that's how i'm gonna end it be the sherpa all right so until next time i bid you do you've been listening to 41 is the mic Presented by KSHB 41, your home of the Chiefs and Chiefs Digest.